Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. The word of God that would lay in your hearts this morning is found written in the fifth, beginning in the fifth chapter of the book of Judges, the sixth verse, and then uh, turning back to the third chapter, verse 31. There we read, In the days of Shamgar, son of Anah, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted and the travelers walked along the byways. After him was Shamgar the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goat, and he also delivered Israel. These are the words the congregation may be seated. <clears throat> Christ Jesus, who is our deliverer, dear fellow redeemed, we live in difficult and troubling times. We face obstacles and attacks on our faith on a daily basis. And as if that weren't bad enough, that we're attacked from the outside, our sinful flesh attacks us from the inside with temptations and doubts and fears. But this is nothing new for God's people. These things have been happening ever since Satan first asked Eve, did God really say? Since Cain murdered Abel, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, or the disciples ran terrified to hide in the upper room. Or even since Luther stood at the Diet of Worms before the emperor and was commanded to recant his stand on scripture or face death. Throughout history, certainly in the days of the judges, God's people have lived in troubling and challenging, even dangerous and deadly times. Throughout a history of such times, God's answer to, answer to his people has been the same as the answer Jesus gave to his terrified disciples as he walked to them across the top of the stormy sea. When they saw him, they were afraid. Jesus called out to them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. As he assures his people through the psalmist, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And so throughout history, this has been God's answer to his people. And so it will continue. That the Lord delivers his people in the midst of troubled times. For he himself has said to you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In Judges chapter 5, we find what is called the Song of Deborah sung by Deborah the judge after her victory over Jabin, king of Canaan. And there she describes what Israel was like before she became a judge, or more accurately, one of the Shephatim, or one of the deliverers raised by God. She tells us that in the days of Shamgar, son of Anna, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted and the travelers walked along the byways. So it was unsafe during Shamgar's time to walk on the roads of Israel. They were deserted. People went along a hidden way. I'm going to go a different way than that because this is too dangerous for me. Well, of course, the root, of, the root cause of the chaos and the lack of safety within Israel was the judgment of the Lord. He was troubling Israel on account of their unfaithfulness to him. But that unfaithfulness manifested itself in Israel's unwillingness to defend her land against their unbelieving neighbors, or even to do as the Lord had commanded originally when they took possession of the promised land and to drive out the previous pagan inhabitants. And it wasn't simply a command from the Lord so that, you know, this is my people need this place, you guys get out. It was to protect God's people to drive out the pagan neighbors who worshiped false gods because the Lord knew that if they stayed there, they would lead his people into sin. That they would lead, him, lead his people away from him. The people have failed to do that, and as a result, the Lord had said to Israel, I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars. 
but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. Now we've seen, though, that even when the children of Israel would raise penitent voices, it would still be up to the Lord to raise up a judge to deliver them, usually single-handedly. And then maybe the people would rise up as a people and defend God's promised land. But Deborah tells us that during Shamgar's time, not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. So not only would the people not defend God's promised land, they didn't have the ability to do it, they didn't even have the weapons to do it. Now the same was true at the time prior to the Reformation. The people were not able to read God's word on account of it being in Latin instead of their own language. But they had also allowed themselves to be misled and abused by their spiritual leaders, by the Roman Catholic Church. So spiritually, the Christian world at that time was not safe to travel because the church itself was bent on robbing the people of their earthly goods while they kept their souls in fear of hellfire, in fear of their Savior, as in afraid of Him. So there was nothing that people could do to defend themselves because they didn't have the weapons. They didn't have the tools. They didn't have God's Word. And they didn't have the know-how. Now in our text, <clears throat> when hundreds of Philistines poured into the Promised Land to dominate God's defenseless people, the Israelites were at their mercy. When the Roman Catholic Church abused their members, God's people were at the mercy of these abusers. The same seems to be true in our day. We face onslaughts and attacks constantly against our church, against our faith, against God and His Word almost every day. So we want to look at our faith life and we want to ask ourselves, do I know how to mount a defense? Do I know how to defeat these enemies? And the short answer is the same answer as at the time of Shamgar and the same answer as at the time of the Reformation. The Lord gives us the victory. Now, the name Shamgar means he is a stranger here. Shamgar was different from the defenseless Israelites around him. He may not have had a shield or a spear, but he did have the God-given ability to defend God's promised land. Now, Shamgar probably was not a warrior by trade, but he was ready to go to battle for God's people. And we're told that Shamgar, the son of Anah, killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goat, and he also delivered Israel. Now notice, Shamgar didn't need sword or a shield or a spear, he went into battle with what he had at hand. An ox goat. You can see a picture of that. I think on the back of the bullet. The back of the calendar. What an ox goat looks like. Uh, you might better know it today as a cattle prod. It was up to 10 feet long and it was used to poke and prod the oxen into getting them to do what you wanted to do. So it's a farm tool. And it may not have seemed like the ideal weapon to kill 600 Philistines, but in the hands of one who was doing the Lord's work, it got the job done and it delivered Israel. At the time of the Reformation, the young monk from Wittenberg seemed like an unlikely champion for God's people with his piece of paper nailed to the door of the church, challenging the Pope to battle, armed only with the word of God. And the Lord used, the Lord of the church used Martin Luther to restore the previously obscured gospel of Christ's free forgiveness of sins to his people. Now for Luther, times only became more dangerous after that. Under the ban of the Pope and the Emperor, in a time when anyone was legally free to hunt Luther down and to kill him, even encouraged not only by the government but by the church, the Lord defended Brother Martin every turn until the Lord had accomplished all that he needed to deliver his people from the spiritual bondage of Rome. 
who, yes, a bishop of Rome, as Pope, who had silenced previous reformers by burning them at the stake, tried also to silence Luther in the same forceful way. But the Lord of the Church would not allow it. Luther continued to proclaim the truth of God's word day in and day out. And in 1521, he began to translate the Bible into the language of his countrymen, so that his translation of the Bible became the property of nearly every German home. It became the basis for the first popular English translation of the Bible. And from Germany then, Luther's translation of the Bible, the Gospel of Christ, spread into all the world. Now as we noted, we find ourselves in similar situations as Shangar, Martin Luther in our own day. Now there aren't 600 Philistines invading our church. And we don't have the Pope trying to burn us at the stake. <clears throat> but look at the state of the church today. After all of the turmoil of the Reformation, those who call themselves God's people, that is Christians, <clears throat> people who call themselves Reformed, even Lutheran, for the most part have let the devil and the world undo most of what God accomplished 500 years ago in the Reformation. The church is losing God's word. It's doing it willingly. It's giving up more and more of the teachings of Scripture every day, agreeing with the world that evolution is equal to or greater than what the Bible says about creation. And God's word, you know, it doesn't really mean what it says. Those scientists, they really know what they're talking about. The world or the church. Can you imagine the church is putting sins like homosexuality on par with God's institution of marriage? Saying, but you know, it's really a woman's choice whether or not to have a baby, even if it means killing that baby. Even allowing that false gods of other religions are alternate ways or even preferable ways to get to heaven. Preferable to God's only Savior, Jesus Christ. And we can raise our voices and shake our heads and say, oh, isn't that terrible? But it goes beyond just an academic shock as those things are coming into our homes every day. Not just on TV, not just on the internet, but as our children bring those things home from school, they're taught them there. They become discussions for our children in the school cafeteria, where our children have to sit there and be abused for what they believe from God's word. They become discussions for us at work, at the lunchroom, or even with friends or acquaintances, family members. So it, it is something, it's not just something that we look at and go, wow, I can't believe it. It's something people say, well, what do you think about this? Isn't it wonderful that we're so enlightened? What are you going to say? What do you say? Are you ready to take a stand and defend God's promised land, that is, His church and His word? When people ask us what we think, are we prepared not just to answer, but are we prepared to present the truth? And we can answer them, yeah, I don't know. Or, I don't really want to get involved. Or, and, you know, I don't really agree with that, but. Or, my church says. Those are all answers. But can we give a real answer from God's word? You don't have to mobilize a battalion to meet the attack. You can pick, pick up what you have. Pick up God's Word. You don't even have to pull out a Bible and give an hour-long presentation. A simple, what God's Word says. That suffices. Because it's not an intellectual battle. As much as the world wants to make it one. And say, well, how can you say that when this is true? I can say that because this is true. It's not an intellectual battle. It's not, 
Well, they're more enlightened than we are, or we're not as smart as they are. God's word says. That's the answer. It doesn't, again, you don't have to pull out passage after passage. God's word says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's not poetry, it's not picture language. Because the Bible plainly says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. What more is there to argue? And what about apostles? What about what about denied history? God was there. He records the history. And you can get into more, you know, you can get into depth with the fossils or, um, you know, the rings on the tree and all that. But again, don't be afraid to speak up and say, no, I don't believe that. God's word says in six days. Jesus says, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? He said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That one covers marriage, covers creation, covers the, last count, 78 different genders that the world wants us to acknowledge. Have you not read in God's word, in the beginning, he made the male head. Or, Jesus says in his word, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He doesn't say no one except, or he says, he doesn't say only no one except for the Christians comes to the Father except through me. He doesn't say no one comes to the Father except through me and Muhammad. No one comes to the Father. No one except through me. Now we've been conditioned by the world to think that such answers are unkind and unloving. Furthermore, we think that unless we can answer every point brought up by an attacker, somehow we've lost the argument or we haven't done what we should. Or unless we can convince everyone that what the Bible says is true, we've somehow let down our God or let down our faith. And none of that is true. Because first of all, is it more unloving to have someone specifically ask us what we think, especially regarding sin or the way to heaven, and then let them go on without God's saving word? Secondly, the world is going to bring up all kinds of arguments, all kinds of supposed evidence or rational arguments to distract us from the fact that their argument is not with us. Their argument is with God. And finally, we're not the ones doing the convincing. Well, this is the most comforting truth. It's God, the Holy Spirit's work, as He works through His Word to change hearts. It may not happen right in front of us. We may not see the results ourselves now, but we offer up the Word and we trust that God will do with it as He will, that He will keep His promise, that His Word will not return to Him void but it will accomplish the purpose that he pleases. Because ultimately, it's God who gives the victory. Just as he did for Shandar, just as he did for Luther. In both those cases, the enemies of God rose up again and again and attacked his people, and again and again, God raised up deliverers throughout history to defend his church and his word. Again and again, The world mounts attacks, and so we might ask, well, what's the point? If enemies are going to keep coming back, why keep on fighting them? Because no one else will, for one thing. Who's going to go if we don't? Look at Shamgar. 40,000 other men vastly outnumbered those 600 Philistines. But 40,000 men let the Philistines walk in. And only one out of those 40,000 stood up. And he made the difference. Because God was fighting with him 
get through him. The visible church has become what it is today because millions of Christians stand by and say, I'm not going to fight. It's not my battle. Why not? Because they're afraid of losing, or they don't know how to fight, or they don't care enough to fight. But what they don't realize, especially those who are afraid, is that God has already given his people the victory. When Jesus died on the cross, crying out, it is finished. And then rising from the dead bodily three days later, Jesus won the victory for us then. Not only did he win for us the forgiveness of sins, but he took away the power of death as a punishment for sin by taking that punishment on himself. He took away the power of the devil to accuse us. And he won for us eternal life, body and soul. So why be afraid? Man can't hurt you. He can only hurt your body right now. He can hurt your feelings or hurt your pride, but he can't keep you out of heaven can't take away the forgiveness of sins. And he can't take away God's word from you unless you let him. If we do that, we lost the battle. Because that's the weapon that God has given us to use. Remember, the world's not arguing with you. It's arguing with God. And what will you say for God in that argument? What will God say through you? Remember Jesus' promise to his disciples. Now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Now that was a special promise to the apostles that the Holy Spirit would speak through them, literally. But it is a promise that God keeps to you as well because he's taught you what to say in his word. He's given you the words in the Bible. From childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. It is written, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. But you may say, well, I failed so often before to speak up, or... I never seem to be able to give the right answer. Well, apply that to the rest of your life. We fall short all the time in school, in sports, at work, at play. We don't stop trying. We keep at it, we keep at it, we keep fighting. Sure, we're going to fall short. But if we offer God's word, trust the promises of God. For one thing, blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son cleanses us from all sin. Jesus paid for all of our sins and our shortcomings. We are forgiven. And so every time that we go out with His Word, we can say, I'm going to do better than last time. God has wiped away my sins. I'm going to pray for Him for strength to do better this time. And secondly, the people that we're fighting against need God's Word too. They need to know but their viewpoint is not just another way to look at things. It's not just a different opinion. It's sin. And they are sinners too. And they need to know that they are wrong. And not they're wrong and we're right. But their worldview is wrong and God's word is right. They need to know that the only way to escape eternal damnation in hell is through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. They need to know that Jesus paid for all of their sins and all of their shortcomings too. That's the real victory in our earthly fight with the world. When God takes his word that we use, and he uses it to convert hardened sinners into his own special people. And he does it every day through his word. Now we're only weak sinners. And we may feel, again, like we could call ourselves, Shandar, strangers here. I don't belong here. The forces that stand against us seem so numerous and so strong and make us feel so out of place. How are we going to remain firm in our commitment to God's word? How are we going to take that word out to the world? How are we going to be assured that our church will continue to stand for God's word? 
to listen to the words of another stranger, Martin Luther, on this matter. He says, he writes, the only thing that we can do in this matter is to believe this and in strong confidence pray in the name of Jesus Christ that since God has established his kingdom and it is his work, he will strengthen it. For he has certainly raised it up without any cooperation, advice, thought, and intention of ours. And hitherto he has also ruled, conducted, and preserved. Nor do I doubt that he will certainly complete it without our advice and cooperation. For I know, says St. Paul, whom I have believed, and am also certain that he is able to give more, to do and help superabundantly more than we ask or understand. He is called Lord, a Lord who is able and willing to help wonderfully, gloriously, and mightily, and just when the need is greatest. Luther continues, we should be men and not God. We should be comforted by his word. And because of his assurance, we should confidently call upon him for help in trouble. Then he will come to our aid. This is the gist of the matter. Nothing else will come of it. Otherwise, our reward would be everlasting unrest. May God keep us from this for the sake of his dear son, our Savior and eternal high priest, our deliverer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Congregation, please.